Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our um, second faculty lecture series of the fall season. Um, I'm Dr. Courtney Allen. I'm the new coordinator for the faculty lecture series for this year. I'll be introducing our esteemed um, speakers tonight. Before I do so, I'd like to just give a little shout out for our next lecture, which is um, Dr. J Jeremy Yeats, or Yates, Yates. October 5th, he's going to be talking, his um, lecture is entitled Challenging the Status Quo Through Research. So, you don't want to miss that. <laughs> okay, before I introduce, I want to just give a little plug for our um, email that we send out each um, lecture just to kind of announce things. If you're not on the email list, please sign this little paper and I will um, include you on the next mass mailing. And um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Robert Dinsky and Dr. Michael Mumper. Um, Dr. Robert Dinsky is a political psychologist, subdivision of social psychology, <laughs> and he is co-teaching a, um, a course with Dr. Michael Mumper, who is from Pol Political Science. Correct. Um, and then the course that they're teaching is actually an interdisciplinary course on the 2016 presidential election. So this lecture is, is stemming off of that. Okay. Without, without more. Thank you. Well, everybody, thanks for coming. This is uh, quite an election, and uh, I imagine there's a lot to talk about. So uh, Dr. Dembski and I are uh, teaching this uh, class together, and uh, I really didn't know anything about political psychology, and he knew very little uh, <laughs> about, about political science. science, and so it's been great fun to uh, sort of hear a different perspective on the same subject. And one of the things very early in the course that we uh, came across is uh, some difference in perspectives on what, uh, what contribution political uh, party platforms have on presidential elections. So um, we'll start today with me talking about uh, how a political scientist sees uh, party platforms, and then we'll move over and have uh, Dembski talk about how a social psychologist, political psychologist, sees... Uh, we'll, we'll save the best to last. Absolutely. <laughs> so uh, the things that we want to cover today are, I want to talk about the development of party platforms, so how they came to be, the changing role that they play in the nominating process. Uh, as we'll see, they've gone from being sort of essential elements of that process to tangential elements. Um, then I want to talk about the, uh, the writing of the 2016 uh, party platforms and uh, some of the context uh, that uh, went into producing those documents. Then I'll hand it over to Dr. Dembski who will talk about Yeah, and what I'll talk about is sort of values in general, what values are what some of the characteristics of values are, and then I'll apply them to politics, and then more specifically, these political <coughs> platforms. And actually, you guys are gonna have an opportunity to take what you've learned from our presentation, and we, we have uh, something interesting for you to do uh, in terms of uh, applying values and looking at actual uh, quotations from the platforms and doing some analysis. Okay. Well, the, um, the term platform has been used to signify a manifesto or a statement of principles since uh, the 1550s. Um, <coughs> And it uh, showed up in American politics, what I say, 1803 is the uh, oldest reference I could find to it. At that point, it was uh, very much the image you would have of a uh, platform. It was uh, viewed as something that someone, usually an individual, would stand on, composed of planks, and uh, would deliver their their opinions would uh, attempt to persuade voters uh, uh, to accept their point of view. So uh, party platforms become, or platforms become party platforms in the election of 1840, which I'm sure you guys all remember. <laughs> um, 
in 1840. Um, Van Buren is, uh, is the president. He's a, uh, he's a Democrat. He's running for re-election. The country is in the midst of uh, quite a recession. People are unhappy with the progress of the Van Buren administration. So he is challenged by the Whig, William Henry Harrison, the war hero. And uh, in an effort to try to uh, bolster his party's position and win the election, Van Buren and the Democrats write for the first time a party platform. Um, it's less than 600 words. I think it's 550 words long. It's kind of nine propositions. We believe this, we believe this, we believe this. Um, and uh, well, they lost the election and uh, Harrison became president. Um, by 1844, every presidential uh, election featured a platform by each of the two major parties. So since then, each party has uh, written a platform and they've uh, gotten longer and longer. Um, they grew in length from this less than a thousand words in uh, 1844 to the 1960s you had uh, party platforms that were almost 50,000 words. They've now shrunk up, I think uh, the, the Democrats was probably 26,000 and the Republicans 35,000 if I can remember this time. Um, now, w these uh, platforms um, were written by the party leaders. So the party leaders would meet every four years uh, at what we now think of as a party convention where they would nominate uh, candidates for president and uh, the leaders would sat th sit down and say these are the things that we value. This is what we want the party to stand for. Then as a second step they would say who is the best candidate to represent these positions? Okay, so. Um, the platform, in some sense, determined who the nominee would be. And at that point, the nominees never came to the convention. You stayed home and waited for a call, or waited for some communication that told you that you had received the nomination. It wasn't until the 1930s when Franklin Roosevelt went to a, a Democratic convention and gave an expect, acceptance speech that it became uh, normal for candidates to go to uh, go to a convention. In any case, the platform was a statement of the party's view by party leaders and the nominees were expected to conform to it. Oops, wrong way. Now, this changed in the 1960s as the presidential nomination process changed. Um, leaders, party leaders, began to lose control over the nominating process. So the process became more democratized. Um, you moved away from caucuses and backroom deals to a process that's more open and much longer. This has been driven um, by a sense among the public that they wanted to be, that voters wanted to be involved in the nominating process, but also the rise of television which allow candidates to uh, communicate to the public much more broadly, not just speak to a few people, and the shift to primary elections. As these three things developed, uh, party platforms, excuse me, uh, the nominating process became uh, more, more open, longer. We moved to an era of candidate-centered elections and away from an era of party-centered elections. Um, rank and file voters, now dominate the nominating process. And you could see this um, clearly at the Democratic Convention where there was all this hubbub, remember, about superdelegates? Well, what are superdelegates? Essentially, they're party leaders. And there was a movement among uh, a large portion of the Democratic Party to say, we don't want the party leaders, we don't want these superdelegates deciding who, will, who our nominee will be. That's something that the voters' party members ought to do. So I guess, uh, looking at this process, we're seeing a, an increased democratization of the yeah. creation of the party platforms. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, we've uh, even developed some new language around the way we talk about uh, party platforms. 
before the 1960s, you would say the nominee was the party's candidate. Okay, so the party would have a candidate. Uh, today, we would say that it is the candidate's party. Right, so the, par the candidate is now the person who is in charge of the party rather than the party being in charge of the candidate. And particularly for the Republicans, I think they're <laughs> at the convention not necessarily happy about this change. Um, all right. Um, one of the things that party platforms <coughs> were supposed to do, had done traditionally from the 1840s, was they communicated the issue positions of the party. So it gave you a document where you could go and look. This is what the party stands for. Um, no longer does it uh, perform that role. That role is now performed by candidates. Right? That you want to know what the party stands for, you listen to the candidates speak rather than reading about the, reading about the platform. And voters today, when you ask them where do they get information about the candidates, they say at the acceptance speeches, which are now watched by huge numbers of people and the debates, which uh, will be watched by huge numbers of people when they begin on Monday. Now, I want to uh, turn to how party platforms are written uh, and a little bit about the 2016 platform before I hand it over to Rob. Um, each political party will write a platform every four years as part of their nominating process. And the platform then remains in place for four years until the next presidential nomination. Um, they will create, each party creates, a platform committee. That committee will uh, be composed of more than 100 um, mid-level party leaders, party activists, folks who are interested, want to uh, become involved in the party, a couple from each state and uh, some at-large folks, so you'll get a, a fairly significant group. And they begin working late winter or early spring. And they schedule a series of meetings um, really all around the country where they'll, the party will show up and announce, we're in Philadelphia, we want to know what you think, and they'll hold hearings and people will come out, they'll gather information, um, ask questions, hold hearings. Um, and then uh, a couple of weeks, a month maybe, before the, the Democrat or before the conventions, um, they will select a platform or a party drafting committee, um, the group that actually writes the platform, which is between 10 and 15 people. Um, this last time, the Democrats committee was chaired by uh, Elijah Cummings, a uh, representative from Maryland and the Republican Platform Committee was chaired by Senator John Barrasso from Wyoming. The committee then finalizes the document. It's, uh, it's sent to uh, the party and on the, to the convention. And on the first day of the convention, it's adopted. It's one of the first items on the um, agenda for the convention. Now, what you can see is that uh, the timing of the writing of this is in some ways <coughs> simultaneous to the nomination of the candidate for president. So you've got these two things going on in parallel um, without each side knowing necessarily how the other side is going to come out. So unlike uh, the process before, which was a sequential one, where you wrote the platform and then picked a candidate, now you're doing both of those at the same time. So occasionally, and in fact this time for sure, you get to uh, the convention and what the party says and what the candidate says don't agree. And so then you've got a couple of days at the beginning of the convention to try to sort that out. Or if you can anticipate it, then uh, you have uh, a little more time to negotiate. But still, you've got to figure it out because you don't want to have a uh, a platform which is expressing different views than the candidate does. 
And so Bernie Sanders and his contingent came in a little bit late on the platform writing process, right? Yes. Yes. So let's talk about uh, how the Democrats' uh, process worked this time. Um, Hillary Clinton had been running for this office for, uh, for four years. Um, she had worked hard to make sure that people who agreed with her um, had become part of the, the platform writing group. Um, and uh, as the process unfolded, the platform looked, the draft platform, looked more and more like her, par her positions and looked very much like the positions of the party in 2008. Um, well, the summer didn't go the way Hillary Clinton had planned. And as, uh, as Bernie Sanders continued to receive support, continued to do better than expected in, in primaries, there was pressure um, on Hillary Clinton to compromise with him, to, to unite the party somehow. And so in the days leading up to the convention, the weeks leading up to the convention, um, Secretary Clinton and Senator Sanders and their representatives had a series of meetings in which she basically said, what do you want? What, do I, what can I give you to bring you into the party to make you uh, a part of this team? And he said, there are a number of things in the platform I would like. And so he proposed a series of changes to the platform at the very last minute, he and his supporters, um, in, a, in an attempt to unify the party. She negotiated and agreed to many of these things and compromised the platform of the Democratic Party considerably to the left. And so the document that came out of the process is uh, what's described as the most progressive platform ever passed by either party. It includes um, la uh, large sections that deal with income inequality. It includes a recommendation to increase the minimum wage to $15, which is something just weeks before she had opposed. Um, it includes a long section on increased banking and financial regulation. It proposes a carbon tax and an expansion of Social Security. These are all things that are in the 2016 Democratic platform that weren't in the 2012 Democratic platform. Now, the Republicans uh, faced a slightly different problem. The people who were writing the convention, or writing the platform at the convention, uh, weren't expecting Donald Trump to be the nominee. They were expecting someone else. So they were writing a platform that would accommodate the positions of other candidates. As uh, Trump pulled ahead and they had to adjust on the fly, there were the same kind of almost opposite negotiations where uh, the party has to decide what will we do with this new nominee? How will we, uh, how will we bring him into the party? We will, will we have a platform that's different than the nominees' positions, or will we compromise? Um, they chose, in many cases, to compromise, and the party was pulled towards Trump. You know, I, I can't really give that a direction. Um, but certainly, um, he had positions that were very different than traditional Republican positions from previous platforms, or what was in the draft platform. And so, uh, in particular, his views on, uh, his views on trade, um, what I think of as protectionism, um, are incorporated throughout the document as part of a compromise with the nominee. There's a, um, a brief discussion of Republican support for the border wall, which is something that hadn't been there before. And there is uh, occasional sort of America first language um, that uh, hadn't been uh, evident in previous Republican platforms. Well, so I guess the question is, from a political science perspective, do platforms matter? 
You know, does, does all this work really mean anything? Clearly, up until the 1960s, there was a role for the platform. Is there a role today? Well, I can say, well, let me say first of all, that most political scientists answer this no, that uh, the platforms are uh, anachronistic in some ways, um, that the policy positions uh, um, don't, ref don't reflect the view of the party and they often don't reflect the view of the nominee. Um, but this time, there's one thing in particular that uh, I think political scientists have found interesting and will over the next few years. Um, these two platforms are more divergent from one another than the two party platforms have been in a very long time. They are also very divergent from the platforms of the party in the previous uh, presidential election. So what you have are two parties that in some ways have made serious shifts in their policy <coughs> positions for this campaign. Now, it's unusual that this happens. And historically, there are only a couple of times where parties have made big shifts in their platform from one nomination cycle to another. And both times, the party that changed um, adopted that new position and it remained the position of the party for a very long time. So it's possible that these changes we've seen in the parties will represent, uh, if not a realignment, certainly a recasting of what the parties stand for. So in 1948, for example, after a, a long debate, the Democratic Party decided to abandon its traditional position in favor of states' rights and embraced a civil rights platform. That became, over time, kind of a centerpiece of what it meant to be a Democrat. Then in 1980, the Republicans, who even in 1976 had uh, endorsed the Equal Rights Amendment, um, by 1980 had changed their mind and took a much more kind of traditional position about, about gender roles and about uh, um, what came to be known as family values. And over time, those positions came to uh, uh, sort of epitomize the Republican Party. So still, while they're interesting, I want to conclude by saying parties don't comp or the platforms don't compel anyone to do anything, right? They are documents produced. They're interesting to read. Um, but there's a, a sort of famous quote by uh, John Boehner, former Speaker of the House in 2012, when at the Republican convention, he was asked, so they've been fighting about the platform. Do you think the platform matters? And uh, he kind of dismissively said, do you know anybody who's ever read the platform? And uh, <laughs> So at, while Boehner's not a political scientist, I think that kind of sums up the way political scientists think about platforms. But uh, in teaching the class, I think we discovered that uh, there's some value there that I hadn't seen, which uh, Professor Dembski will never understand. Yeah, this is the third time uh, I've taught this interdisciplinary course on the presidential election. I did it in 2008 and 2012. But I did it with a mass communications faculty member. And so we, the focus was looking at uh, political psychology and how that can sort of um, uh, interact with mass communications. And so we never really read the platforms. And so this was the first time I had ever sat down and read a party platform. And I thought, wow, this is really interesting. Coming from a social psychology background, um, one of the major focus areas of social psychology is political psychology, applying uh, psychological processes to understanding politics, essentially. And I thought, wow, this platform is a, a treasure trove of a lot of information. One of the big areas in political <coughs> psychology is ideology and studying uh, ideologies or worldviews. So what makes up an ideology? Uh, and looking at these platforms, 
this is an expression of political ideology. And, and of course, uh, as I learned from Dr. Mumper, you know, the, the candidates aren't really bound to these, these uh, documents, but yet they, they're sort of a, a really an important window at looking at uh, how, conservative, how conservativism gets expressed on the, through the Republicans and how liberalism gets expressed through the Democrats and then everybody else in between. Um, so the focus from a political psychology standpoint is ideology. These, I view these as sort of ideological documents. They're sort of a window into a political worldview. And so when we're talking about ideology, we're talking about, well, what are the values that underlie this document? What are the, the beliefs, the political beliefs, what are the political attitudes, and so on. So when we talk about ideology, ideology is sort of this broad world view that contains all these cognitive components to it. Uh, and so I got this fascination uh, about these platforms by actually sitting down and, and reading them. So, uh, so that's how we sort of got, I sort of got interested in uh, uh, the idea of platforms. Um, but thinking about values in general, uh, you've heard the term family values. We like to instill proper values in our children. Uh, and when we think of values, we think of principles, right? Principles that people live by. And we like to view ourselves as principled persons, you know? Our principles are ethical, right? And they guide and they direct our behavior. And so in that sense, uh, values uh, become important, and I'll define what a value is shortly here. But we give a lot of lip service to values in politics and in everyday life. Now, whether we actually live by them or not is sort of another question. But at least they're important enough that we want to talk about them and that we sort of idealize them in, in some particular way. Um, so, Let's look at a, let's see. So values are generalized beliefs. So very broad, general statements of belief, you could say, that pertain to <coughs> desirable end states. So for example, what do we want to be? What do we want out of life? Most of us want to be happy, right? Most of us want to have a fulfilling life. Those are desired end states. So in that sense, then, they can be considered values. <clears throat> values transcend uh, specific situations. So when we interact with each other, uh, we want to be honest, right? So in a sense, honesty uh, is a value, but we can apply that value as a mode of conduct in a whole variety of situations. We want our politicians to be honest to us. We want to be honest with each other. Uh, and that honesty uh, sort of creates a movement towards maybe other desired end states that we want. We want a happy life. If we want to be happy, we need to be honest with each other, and, and so on. Um, Values uh, guide the selection, evaluation, behavior of events and people. So a while back, uh, uh, Hillary Clinton uh, fainted. Uh, she had uh, pneumonia. The, the Republicans said she wasn't uh, being forthright in talking about her, uh, her health situation. That whole attack was a values attack. What was the value, do you think, that was being challenged in Hillary Clinton by saying that uh, she wasn't being forthright in describing and, and letting everybody know that she was suffering from pneumonia? What was the value that was violated? Honesty. Honesty, Honesty. Honesty. yeah. She, wa she wasn't being honest with, with us. We want our politicians to be honest, right? If they're not honest, how can we trust them? Trust, another value, right? 
So a lot of these attacks that we see from day to day in different situations bring them up. A lot of these attacks underlying them are, are value statements about the opposition. And then of course when candidates talk about themselves, they always want to portray themselves as being very principled uh, uh, candidates. Um, uh, when you think of Donald Trump, I think of this, this idea of Trump wants to convey strength. Trump wants to convey power. Okay? In a sense, power is a value. We all want power to some degree in our lives because power brings, brings us the things that we want, or at least we think they do. And so when, Trump's, when Trump conveys himself and says, Mexico is going to pay for the wall, underlying that is the idea, I've got the power to tell Mexico what to do. And people admire that. People want somebody who's powerful uh, in, the, in the presidential office. Um, so when we evaluate candidates, when we evaluate each other, oftentimes we do so in terms of the values that we hold. Although we may not uh, explicitly think in those terms, but implicitly at, at, a, at a more, uh, a less than conscious level, I think that's what we're doing. Values can be ordered in relative, uh, relative importance. So we hold some values more strongly than we do other values. When we look at the political candidates, when we look at the, the party platforms, some values stand out more than other values do. Uh, if I was to give you a list of 10 values, you could probably pick the top three that are most important for you. And then the others will sort of follow behind in some way. Uh, characteristics of values. So there's been a lot of research in political psychology and social psychology to look at values and how values relate to each other. And the reason that we're doing this is we're looking at ideology and we're trying to understand ideology, we're trying to understand worldviews, and what are the cognitive components that uh, make up a worldview. What are the cognitive components that make up a political ideology. And researchers that have found that there's not 30, 40, or 50 of them. There's maybe 5, 10, maybe 15. And to some degree, different theorists in this area sort of disagree on what some of the essential values are. It's not an uncommon thing in psychology for disagreement. Uh, and so it's sort of the disagreement and the comparing of different um, value types that sort of moves the science forward in, in terms of understanding ideology. Uh, values can make judgments easy. Sometimes uh, political judgments get uh, complicated, especially when we, we talk about sort of policy issues. So the, the Pacific Trade Agreement, what's the impact of that going to be on our country? That can get really, really complicated. But if a candidate says, you can trust me, and my opposition is, is not being truthful, we all understand that. That's a very simple human thing to understand that this person is ethical or this person isn't ethical. And so oftentimes what voters do is they don't necessarily make voting choices based, based on sort of rational, deliberative understanding of policy issues but they do it on uh, person perception issues. Do I like this person? Can I trust this person? Can I sit down and have a cup of coffee with this person? And underlying these kinds of approaches to making political judgments, sometimes values play a role. And so in that sense, values can make political judgments very easy. I can't trust Hillary Clinton. Okay. I don't know why, but I've sort of come to this conclusion that she can't be trusted. Yeah. Uh, and so sometimes uh, voter decisions are based on these kinds of things. Uh, values exist in systems. In other words, there's, there's logical relationships between particular values. And you'll, you'll see that more concretely in, in a minute. 
uh, values can be relatively stable after we've sort of entered into uh, early adulthood to middle adulthood we sort of know what we value in life sometimes those change but research shows that the changes if they do happen are not really uh, very great at least for, for most people so once we develop a set of values that we want to live by those values become relatively stable. Uh, values can be compatible with other values. So I mentioned benevolence and universalism, and you'll see in a minute uh, what those values actually entail. But some of the values co-occur with each other, and then other values are sort of in opposition to each other, and you'll see this in a minute. And then the other thing, especially in relation to politics, is that we share values with other people. When you look at liberals, when you look at conservatives, there are certain values that liberals hold in general that may be different than the values that conservatives hold. And then these get reflected in the policy positions of the political parties. These get reflected to some degree within uh, the party platforms. Uh, values uh, can form in, in the uh, pre-adult years. So essentially adolescence and early adulthood is, is where uh, the, what we want out of life sort of begins to solidify. Uh, for some folks it takes a little longer, but in general by 25 or 30, most people sort of know what they want. How to get there is another question, right? But in terms of the values and, and the key attitudes that they hold and the basic assumptions about what it means to be human and what humans want out of life, by the early to mid-20s, that begins to uh, solidify. Okay. So I've talked a little bit about values. And what I want to share with you is a particular value system that was created back in the early 90s. And it lists uh, 10 different values. And uh, once you get this, read over it because I'm going to give you a graded assignment here shortly. And if your grade is too low, you won't be able to leave until you get it right. <laughs> the idea of wanting independence of thought and behavior. Stimulation, the desire for novelty, for challenge, for variety in life. Hedonism, the desire for pleasure and gratification. Power, the desire for status, prestige, dominance, control. Uh, security, the desire for safety. Harmony, stability in society. Uh, conformity, the desire for restraint of action. Uh, as social animals, conformity is an extremely powerful uh, value to some degree. And when we don't conform, sometimes we know it, right? We get told. Uh, the desire for restraint of actions, inclinations, Impulses likely to harm others that violate expectations and norms. Tradition, the desire for respect, commitment, and acceptance of, acceptance of customs and ideas of one's culture or religion. Benevolence, the desire for the welfare of others in everyday actions. So benevolence and universalism are, are different. Initially, I sort of got those confused. Benevolence focuses on the interaction that we have with each other in sort of a face-to-face -face kind of way. Universalism, the desire for understanding, appreciation, tolerance, and the protection of the welfare of all people and nature. 
meaning people that we have never met and we will never meet. Okay. But it also sort of extends to uh, having a, an appreciation for nature and the role that nature uh, might play in, uh, in our lives as a species. Values may resistant, be resistant to change. Uh, to some degree, that might be true. OK, so let's look at values in politics here. So I've sort of already talked about political ideology and the role, the role that values play in political ideology. And I would contend that the party platforms are a window into the values, at least in part, not completely, but at least the values, a uh, window into the values of the, of the two parties. Uh, values underlie political processes and thinking. I've already sort of talked about the role that values might play in how we perceive uh, the party candidates, how we make judgments about the party candidates. Um, values underlie political attitudes. Political attitudes are just simply the evaluations that we have of, of politicians, the, the evaluations that we have of different policies, the evaluations that we have of how politicians behave. So Donald Trump has a particular style. I'm sure to some degree we all have an attitude about his style. We may also have an attitude towards uh, uh, Clinton's style as a politician. Uh, values can underlie political rhetoric. I guess it was back in the 80s when the, this idea of family values was really important. Uh, uh, and so uh, values either explicitly or implicitly uh, play a role in what politicians say. They may not come out and say, I value this. But if you read between the lines, you'll see, oh, uh, Donald Trump holds this particular value because he's saying this particular thing. You know? uh, Why well, I think one of the important values that Donald Trump is espousing is this idea of security. We want the nation safe. Right? Now, of course, the Democrats are going to say the same thing, too. I mean, they want a safe nation, too. And so they're going to espouse this value of security. The difference comes in, well, how are you going to do that? And that's how, how parties may differ, but they may, the policies that they propose may come from the same value. Okay. All right. I have a second hand out here. I got so enamored with the um, party platforms, and I didn't stay up till midnight reading all of them. But actually, when you look at the party platforms, and when you look at the political candidates' website, and when you look at what the candidates are saying, I see a fair amount of consistency there. Okay? And that's why, from an ideological standpoint, from a political psych standpoint, that's why I think party platforms at least are important in that sense. Now, as Dr. Mumper mentioned, you know, the, the candidates may not follow what's in the platform. And so that, in that sense, then the platforms become minimized. But in terms of understanding the world view of the parties, I think that's where platforms come, uh, are important. Okay, so this is, uh, this is your exam right here. Not really. But I think it'll be sort of maybe a fun thing to do. Did you 
you get one of these? I have one. Oh, you've got one. Yeah. I tell my students whenever I give them handouts in class, I say, you know you all are keeping a scrapbook, right, for each mm -hmm. course. Mm -hmm. And this is going to go in your scrapbook, right? So 30 years later, you're going to pull out your scrapbook that you've kept all these years because of your memories of Adam's state, right? And you're going to look back fondly and say, oh, Dr. Jesse, man, he was so tough, but yeah, I really learned a lot. Right? <laughs> OK, so this is 20 statements. These are 20 quotes. 10 were pulled from the Democratic platform, and 10 were pulled from the Republican platform. Your task, being the political sophisticates that you are, <laughs> otherwise you wouldn't be here, right? Um, your task is to identify what you think uh, where these quotes came from. And so you'll see on the left-hand side, by the numbering there, a blank. And so in that space, you can put an R or a D, depending on which platform you think that statement came from. So I'll give you a few minutes to do that. Uh, read through these. Some of these might be very easy. Some of them might be more difficult. Uh, and then we'll talk about that briefly, and then we'll go on to uh, one other task. By the way, there is a correct answer <laughs> for this. It's either right or it's wrong. Question? Okay, um, were some of these easy to do? Yes. And uh, would you sort of share with the rest of us uh, uh, which item number you thought was easy and who you attributed that item number to? So volunteer, yes. Number 19. Number 19, okay. Okay, Democrat. Okay, and why did you, why did you pick Democrat? Uh, the emphasis on the uh, climate change. Yeah, that's sort of a Democrat, Democratic issue, right? You may know better than I do, but I, I think the Democratic platform focuses a lot more on climate change than the Republican platform does, okay? Uh, another example of something easy, easy. yeah, Jess? Uh, 13 would be a Democrat. Yeah, yeah, and so the focus on civil rights, uh, voting rights, women's rights, LGBT rights, uh, democratic issue, yeah. One other uh, item that was easy for you. Yeah. Eight. Eight? Uh, and who did you attribute that to? The Democrat. And why? <laughs> okay. Was there any that uh, you had difficulty? Yeah, Dan. Well, I just wanted to say since the ones we've identified so far have all been Democrat that I found uh, number 11 to be very much a Republican Party um, statement. And what was in that statement that sort of tip, tipped you off there? Yeah, I mean, it basically is getting what the role of government is, um, mm -hmm. and it's talking about border control and immigration, mm -hmm. and also schools, which are both issues that Republicans mm -hmm. talk about and mm -hmm. are concerned with in that way. Right, right, right. And, and number seven. Number seven. Was that easy or hard for you? That was really easy. Okay. State State control, right? That should tip off all you political sophisticates. What about uh, what about ones that were difficult? Anybody have any difficulty with a couple of these? And, and which ones were they? Four. Number four. Okay. And so, why was that difficult for you? We believe American exceptionalism because of our historic role, and so on. Okay, and, and, and in what sense do Republicans and Democrats sort of buy into this idea of uh, the greatest country on earth, I guess you could Well, say. I feel like, so the last term there, or the last phrase in exemplar of liberty, really describes sort of a democratic belief. Uh -huh. However, this notion of elitism, uh -huh. we are exceptional. We are uh -huh. That's obviously probably part of my own bias. Uh, yeah. I would say that both parties say we are the greatest. They do. 
Yeah. They do. Yeah. 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 Then a defender, he's not going to take you to this process. He says, we have the best. That's it. But this is definitely, definitely democratic. That's democratic, you think? Yeah. Okay, here you go. I'm going to give you the answers. Count up the number you got right, the number you got wrong. And there are objective answers to this now. Okay, so number one is Republican. Number two is Democrat. Number three is Republican. Number four is Republican. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Number five is Democrat. Number six is Republican. Number seven is Republican. Number eight is Democrat. Number nine is Democrat. Number 10 is Republican. Number 11 is Republican. Number 12 is Democrat. 13 is Democrat, 14 is Republican, 15 is Republican, 16 is Democrat, 17 is Democrat, 18 is Republican, 19 Democrat, 20 Democrat. Wow. Okay, so count up your number correct. Give you a minute to do that. You can get your calculators out if you want, or nope. your, your cell phones. I did good. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask for a show of hands. How many of you got 15 or more correct? Okay, very good, very good. Okay, um, I think what that points to is sort of your general understanding of the two parties. <coughs> And a lot of that comes from maybe being aware of what's going on in the news or so on. But I think in general, from an ideological standpoint, the, the people that pay attention to politics sort of know what the underlying differences are. Okay, the last thing we're going to do, we just have a couple of minutes. Remember that I gave you the uh, values sheet with the 10 values. And we're not going to have uh, time to, to go through all of these. But let's say, let's go through maybe the first three. Take those first three statements, one, two, and three, look at your values list, and then on the line, the blank line to the right of the quote, write in the value that you think that statement reflects. And just so one value? You can put in one or more values. Okay. And this is where it's going to get messy, and this is where we might have some differences, and that's okay. So we're allowed more than one? Yes. But you need to be able to justify. Pardon me? Yes. Those ten values right there. Yep. Okay, let's see what you've come up with for the first quote. We ask for divine help in our country to fulfill its promise volunteer on the implicit value underlying that statement and, and why you think that value, excuse me, is the implicit value. Volunteer. Yes. Pardon? Respect the vision. Pardon me? I put tradition. And why did you put tradition? Because we want to have the respect of everybody else, but we want to also be able to have that power to make our own decisions, but yet to come together and help cooperate? Yeah. So, uh, historically, we're a Christian nation, right? And asking for divine help uh, refers back to our Christianity, in a sense, right? Okay. Did anybody put a different value for that? Okay. Yeah? Yeah, I, I put power because one of the words used with power, number five, is authority, and divine authority seems to be a pretty prominent aspect of, yeah. of thinking about that. Yeah. So if, if there is, in fact, a promise for America, being able to fulfill that promise implies that there has to be some sort of power to be able to do that. Okay, let's look at number two. Uh, out of many, we are one. 
Volunteer on that one, yeah. I put 10. You put 10? Uh, and 10 is universalism, right? And, and why did you put universalism? Because, of, I mean, out of the many that, I mean, thinking many, you're not going to know all of them. So, uh huh. Okay. Okay, so this idea of unity uh, uh, implies some sort of universality that we all sort of share. Did anybody uh, choose another value? Okay. Number nine. Okay, and number nine was which one? Benevolence. Uh, benevolence. Okay. Uh, and why benevolence? Uh, desire for welfare of others and everyday interactions. Okay, okay. So we can seek that unity not only in people that we will never meet, but we can uh, seek that unity in, in, in our daily lives too. Right. Okay. We're getting close to running out of time. So what I want to show you here is uh, I did a values analysis of, of these 20 statements, and I assigned values to them. Um, if you were to do the same thing, you would probably come up with different results. And from my point of view, that's okay. Because this is sort of a tough task to do. And there's a lot of inferences that go into assigning these values. And that's what makes this part of understanding ideology difficult. But it also makes it sort of challenging and interesting. So uh, when I looked at the 10 Republican statements, four of them reflected self-direction, three power, three universalism, two tradition, two security, and one achievement. When I looked at the 10 Democratic quotes, nine of them reflected universalism, two power, two achievement, and one security. So what, what's the difference there? As, assuming that I'm somewhat accurate, what difference do you see in those results? One diversified one is not. Pardon me? One is diversified and the other one is not. Yeah, there's much, there's much more implicit values. There's a greater variety of implicit values on the Republican side compared to the Democratic side. And of course, on the Democratic side, we have a real focus on uh, universalism there. And that comes out in multiple kinds of ways. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so thinking about party platforms, uh, thinking about po politics in general, oftentimes uh, the values that politicians hold, the values that we hold, uh, help us to make judgments about uh, political choices. Um, you know, what can we identify with? Do we identify with a candidate that wants strong security? Do we want to identify with a candidate that espouses universalism? And there's no right answer to that. It's, it's a personal preference. And so when you get down to the, the challenge of politics, at, at one level, it's, it's, a, it's a fight of values. There's also much more in it as well. But at least at one level, uh, it's, 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 it's uh, you know, what do we as a country, what do we want to value? And how do our values get reflected in our political process? Do you want to say anything in closing? No, no. I think uh, I had never really thought about values like this before, but um, it, it certainly helped me to understand how so often a voter will say, well, I disagree with this candidate on these policy issues. I don't support the wall or, or whatever the issue is. But very often a little later they'll say, you know, but I support the candidate. I would think, well, why is that? Well, there's something implicit in, in the values associated with what they've said that corresponds to someone's internal values. And they say, I can identify with this, with this candidate. I can support this candidate even if we disagree on some really fundamental policy issues. So Courtney, how much time do we have left? Are we completely out of time? We have about 10 minutes for questions. OK, so 10 minutes for questions for either Dr. Mumper or, or myself. Don't make them too difficult. Have you done something similar with the Green Party and the Libertarian? Uh, that would be a great thing to do, but I haven't, no. What about um, people who don't vote for somebody but vote against somebody? Okay, and so what do you think is going on there? I think sometimes they rationalize. They just like someone so much that they rationalize who they're going to vote for. 
and maybe assign some values to that person mm -hmm. that may be, yeah, yeah. maybe not there? Yeah. Sometimes people vote uh, based on a, an emotional reaction to the candidate. Both, can, both emotional reactions can be negative, and so they're going to vote against somebody as opposed to voting for somebody. And those emotional reactions oftentimes are guided by processes that we're not completely aware of, and sometimes those processes are value-related. Sometimes those processes are identity-related. Can I identify with this candidate? Yes, I can. No, I can't. The voter doesn't necessarily consciously think in that way, but unconsciously, that kind of thing is going on, and they know at a gut level, I don't like this candidate. Maybe because they don't identify with the candidate, maybe they don't identify with the, the implicit values, and maybe they can't even express what those value positions are, but they know this gut reaction. And the interesting thing about making political decisions is that in, from a psychological standpoint, a lot of what goes on when we make judgments is unconscious. All we know is the end result. I don't like that candidate. And then we ask, well, why not? Well, then we create post hoc explanations. And we have to think really hard sometimes. And if you ever see interviews of people on the street from the, in the media, who are you going to vote for? And they'll say, oh, I'm going to vote for Trump. Well, why? Well, I just like the guy. You know. But something else is going deeper that they don't really understand. You mentioned voters not necessarily understanding at a conscious level why they side one way or the other, and that made me think of uh, those who might be, and I'll admit I'm one of them, of uh, sort of this ignorance of a platform stance. Mm -hmm. I've never read a platform, right? I don't, I don't know what these sort of explicit statements are in terms of the values and beliefs and the, the position of a particular party, uh, but I do know that I personally tend to err on the side of the Democrat, and that when I don't know, uh, never at the national level, but at, at the state and local level, I'll admit to, well, I don't know the Republican candidate or the Democratic candidate. I will err on the side over default to voting for Democrats. How much do you think these ideological schema, or maybe some type of subconscious level, influence people's voting patterns? I, I think they influence a lot of voting, a, a lot of people's voting patterns, especially people who have a passing interest in politics. For people that really follow politics, maybe not so much, but I think that sort of casual voters, I think they use these kinds of heuristics, oh, he or she's a Democrat, I'm gonna vote for him, or I really, I like this person, I identify with that person, uh, I'm gonna vote for them. And so oftentimes for the less uh, interested voters, we use these heuristics uh, to, to, to vote, and we don't really, consciously understand explicitly why, unless we really sit down and explore them. I guess I'm guilty at fault for that, time. I don't know if it's guilty at fault or if it's just what you do, but when you read the judges, blah, 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 if it's Democrat or Republican, I tend to vote Republican, I don't know. So mm -hmm. I'm the same way, your get is Republican, mm -hmm. Republican, yeah. I'm gonna vote straight Republican to get enough to do, right, right. regardless were, of what you know. Were your parents Republicans? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> Interesting. So it was a reaction against your parents. Well, I, w I was a reaction against my parents. They were Republicans, and I lean on the Democratic side. What do you attribute to the fact that most of the signs we're seeing don't tell you if they're Republican or Democrat? That's, that's quite deliberate, I believe, right? And you probably know better why that is than I do. Uh, um, or, or I could say something too. <laughs> uh, sometimes if, if you don't know what their party affiliation is, then you don't have that heuristic to make the decision. You know, if, if, you, if you vote a straight party ticket, and if you know them as, as one party or the other, you have no idea what their policies are, you use that heuristic or, or, or uh, short, uh, shortcut. That's what a heuristic is, it's a shortcut. Well, I think the, the <coughs> sort of next uh, shortcut is, uh, do I know this person? Do I know the name? And uh, so often it's, uh, gee, I, maybe I'm going to vote the party, but boy, I know this person's name, or I've seen this person, I've seen a lot of signs for them. So um, you can win some votes that way. 
that you wouldn't have won if you have the the party clearly identified. Yeah. Yeah. People will see it and say no. And I'm so Darius know. Allen is running for county commissioner. I've never met him. I don't know what party he is. But being a lazy voter in local elections, if I know he's a Democrat, I'll probably vote for him. Danny. Um, so for the half of eligible voters who don't vote at all, can we infer that it's because they don't see candidates who share their values, or what's going on there, you know, psychologically? No voters. Doesn't matter. <laughs> Why don't count? Well, I know college students vote at one of the lowest levels of all demographics. That's because they're interested in, in two things that don't relate necessarily, <laughs> that they don't see relate to politics, sex and drugs, right? <laughs> they're too busy doing other stuff. So, you know, so they're distracted. So that might be one reason why people don't vote. Another reason might be they're just totally disgusted with the whole process. And there I, might be other reasons. I think political scientists uh, often talk about a calculus that people make, a, a time and energy you have to invest in voting and becoming knowledgeable, and the possibility that your vote will actually make a difference. And, and people make that calculus and say, you know, I'm going to trust other people to yeah. Yeah. make these decisions. It's too much vote. effort. i got to take care of the kids. Uh, or my vote doesn't count. And of course, if everybody feels that way, then the elites are saying, go for it. Yeah, the fewer people we have voting, the better. Right? Just wondering if we have done the same uh, exercise four years ago, since it's a four-year cycle. I bet you the universalism would be much lower because the, we are only one country out of 179 countries in the world. And most of the people in the world are going to, for everybody. University. Would you think would be that result makes sense? It could. Yes. I think if you would have done this analysis of the first draft of the Democratic platform, you would have found much less universalism. But that, that comes in, in in such a dramatic way as a result of the compromises that happen at the very end of the writing of the document. Yeah, maybe Bernie Sanders' influence on the economic side to some degree. <coughs> Are candidates at the midterm elections expected to follow the platform to any extent? Expected by who? <laughs> by, I don't know, the party. So um, certainly the party would like them to follow. Voters expect them to follow, perhaps. And generally, I, I saw a study uh, at members of Congress. Um, Democrats vote with their party platform about 80% of the time and Republicans vote for their party platform about 90% of the time. So members of Congress certainly, whether they're referring to it or not, they have uh, accepted the values of the party and um, when it comes time to vote, they vote for positions that are represented in the platform. But there's no, um, I think there's no expectation, and you get your arm twisted by the speaker, but other than that, one last question? All right. Thank you very much for your attendance.